Our scripture reading this afternoon is from Luke chapter 12. We'll be reading from verse 35 to verse 48. We're somewhat still in the middle of Luke chapter 12. We hope to consider um, verses 35 through 40 in the sermon today, but we'll read to verse 48. So beginning in verse 35 of Luke chapter 12. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from a wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, Blessed are those servants. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is he, is that faithful and wise servant, steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink, and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware And will cut him in sunder. And will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will. And prepared not himself neither did according to his will. Shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes. Shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given. Of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Thus far, may the Lord bless the reading of his word. And we now sing together the theology of watching. Um, This is the title I have for the next section that we arrive here in Luke chapter 12, Um, the Lord Jesus has very ably and very clearly, remember, announced to the crowds things that are to be feared and things that we ought not to fear, things that we are to be careful about, remember the key word beware, and things we are not to worry about. Things that we are not to give thought, take no thought for your life. Um, The Lord Jesus, in a very precious and harmonious way, um, ever since, um, even a little bit before chapter 12, began this theme of things we are to fear and things we are not to fear. In chapter 12, 12, he, he starts declaring that we are to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We were told that we are to fear hypocrisy. Right with that, Jesus says that we're not to fear, however, the hypocrite. We're not to fear the person who in his hypocrisy may even come towards you as a persecutor. Don't fear that, but do fear the sin. And then he turned around and he said, but do fear God. But then he said, but do not fear his provisions, that he will forget you. Don't don't fear that he would forget you, because he won't. 
But then he turned around and said, but do fear to deny Jesus. And he added to that, and do fear to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Fear God and fear sinning against God. The three persons of the Trinity, we are to fear that. But then he turned around and he said, do not fear. And with the theme of these persecutors who would come your way, that you're not to fear them, you're also not to fear what to tell them. Jesus even said, the very Holy Spirit, whom you would not blaspheme against, if you would fear this right way, he's the very one who would help you to give an answer to those persecutors. Don't don't fear about what to say. Don't fear about the day of your defense. Don't fear about when it comes to the point of maybe even a judgment where you're probably arrested and, and there's a danger of life or death. Don't fear. He will tell you what to say. And he turns around and he says, fear covetousness. Again, another sin. Fear covetousness. And he ended it all saying, don't fear about even the most basic things in life, such as food and clothing. It is amazing how mathematical it is where the Lord Jesus goes from one thing to the next with this polar opposite realities of fearing this, not fearing that. The very last thing was the reality of of not fearing. And notice how it really is what Jesus is saying. Look at verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We are so much not to fear food and clothing that Jesus says, you don't have to fear. You're, You're going to receive the kingdom. Why would you fear about some clothing and some food and some minor little things? And you can even put here, don't fear that the stock market might sink completely your your whole um, um, revenue. Because see, in this category are the minor things. And Jesus is saying, don't fear, you're going to get the kingdom. Jesus is saying, um, fear these things, don't fear these things. Now, from verse 35 on, as you read through this whole portion, we, even into chapter 13, a few verses into chapter 13, what seems to happen now is the Lord Jesus will, will help you and me know how not to fear those things that we ought not to fear and how to fear the things that we ought to fear. The Lord Jesus will show how important it is to have this demeanor. And and it will come all into one demeanor. And and I firmly believe that what we have here is now introducing to us the, the whole theology of watchfulness. And when you are someone who watches, and we're going to see with detail what that is, this watchfulness will help you fear what you ought to fear and not fear what you ought not to fear. And and Jesus begins by showing even how important this heart of watchfulness is. And just to give you a general outline, um, we read the first two portions under this theme where the Lord Jesus gives one major parable of the watchful servant. And then later in verse 42 on, that second portion that we read after Peter asks a question, the Lord Jesus gives a parable there of the non-watchful servant. So the first thing he does is paint two portraits, one of a servant who is watchful, one of a servant who isn't. And in each one of these, he does bring the context of of a non-watchful servant in a very small way here, and of a watchful servant in a very small way here. But the main thing is of a watchful servant first, and then a non-watchful. And see, what Jesus is doing is, is... Pressing upon your heart this way and mine. And it's amazing to see how, it's, how it works. It has to work. This is, this is divine um, teaching. It is God as, as a divine teacher teaching your heart and mind to have this watchfulness. And the first thing he does is give us pictures and illustrations. It works with children. And so it should work with adults. And, and we have these pictures of a watchful servant, a non-watchful servant, with very drastic realities of what happens when you do watch, what happens when you don't watch. And then in verses 49 through 53, there's a little portion where, where the Lord Jesus is preparing our hearts and showing that there will be tension while you're watching. And it won't be easy to have a watchful heart. 
A lot of Christians, they, they kind of in dismay turn around and, and feel like they purchased the wrong product because they really thought that becoming a Christian was all about the, the golden um, pathways in, 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 in heaven and, and the crown of gold. And they thought of the glory, the crown, but not so much the cross. And then they're dismayed. There even some people turn around and say, that gospel's not for me. But they were presented not the full gospel and not the true gospel. So verses 49 to 53, the Lord Jesus is very honest. And he's saying that there will be tensions for the one who is watching. And then verses 54 through 56 he, Jesus will give that little portion where he speaks of how important it is that we would learn to discern the times. And, and so everything is geared up to the reality that we're watching something that will happen in the future. We need to live each and every day as if that thing that will happen may be in a thousand years, but it could be in five minutes. And are you watching right now? And so there's a little portion saying how we should be very diligent to discern the times so that this watching is really in our hearts and we are really thinking of, of watching. Verses 57 through 59, which is now the very last portion of chapter 12. I could put it under the title of the great danger of not watching. The great serious danger when you do not watch. The very beginning of chapter 13, the, just about five verses, we could put it under the umbrella of, of the beginning of watching, how you begin to be someone who watches, who has this watchful heart. And then with that famous parable of the barren fig tree, it is how I believe the Lord Jesus concludes this whole section where he's showing the end of those who do not watch. It's like one last conclusion of how drastically serious this is. So that what we have here, see, we, we have to think, this is why I summarize the very beginning. All of those things that we are to fear and not fear, don't lose them out of sight. Because now Jesus is going to show how important it is that you live as one who does fear what you should fear and does not fear what you ought not to fear under this theme of watchfulness, of readiness and what is then this watchfulness and readiness all about? In our first point, we have these principles that explain what it is. It is a servant's heart. The first principle of, of a watchful heart is that of a servant's heart. And so let me start reading the very um, section where Jesus starts, verse 35. So Jesus starts saying, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Um, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord. The, the word wait is already the watching. Is someone waiting, watching their Lord when he will return from the wedding. And, and you're waiting for a Lord. That means you are a servant. And then verse 37, he says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. So that's the first principle. If you are a servant... You are watching. And that is part even of our culture. You know, um, it's still used, but it was more in the past. People who waited tables were waiters or waitresses. And even though they use an, a more modern word, it's, it's not really modern. It's, it's very biblical, actually. They're called servers. That is what a waiter is. If, if people wondered why a waiter, well, that's what he is. It's, a waiter is someone who serves. He serves you at your table or, or she serves you. So to wait for their Lord is a demeanor of service. And, and, and there is that idea of waiting because you're listening and, and, and when they say they need something, you're there at their service. Um, and this is how we relate to God as our master and we as his servant. A demeanor of servanthood. And now, if you believe that you are the owner of your own life, you will not be watching because you will not have a servant's heart. If you have not submitted your life to the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you're not watching. Have, have you noticed that even in the most basic ways that we can speak of salvation, what, what does it mean to be saved? It means to trust 
Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Not only as your Savior who will deliver you, but your Lord who will be the master over you, under whom you will submit and serve. Um, that's, that's what it means to be watching. Um, and if you're not a servant, you will not care. You, and, and, and then it will follow. You won't be afraid of those things God said to be afraid. And you will worry about those things that Jesus said not to worry. And, and your heart will be going in all kinds of directions. You will be your own Lord, your own master. And so you will have to obey yourself. And, and see, if you know any little bit about your own heart, you would see what a misery that will be. Can you trust yourself as your own master? Really? In the secular world, that's how people want to insist that that's how they live. I am my own master. I'm the captain of my fate, of my destiny. But what a good captain is it that, that always ends up in the grave? I've never found one human other than Jesus who is truly a captain of his own fate. You see, we can say it, but it only lasts so many years. And then the last thing that perhaps you may have said might be in a book, might be an epitaph on the tombstone. But do we walk the graveyard and we see masters of their own fate? No. There are people whom death has harvested. And this is where we do well to acknowledge the simple truth. Lord, I am not the master of my own soul. Thou art. And I want to be a watchful servant. I want to be a servant who waits in thee. Now, in this whole context, even the word waiting, it's not only servanthood. The word waiting makes you think of something that you need to be ready about. And this is what we find almost in the whole passage that, that I've read in summary to you has something connected to it and some, something that will happen in the future. And, and it's all regarding, of course, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at verse 37, it says, Blessed are the servants whom the Lord, when he cometh. If you go to verse 46, it says, The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. Even the very small parable in verse 39 speaks of a thief that will come unawares. Jesus is using even the example of a thief because of it being some time that you're not expected. That's why you find the principle that Jesus will return like a thief in the night. Not that he's taking the emblem of a thief for who a thief is, but for a thief in terms of when he comes, which is in a time unexpected. And then you continue reading in verse 54 um, and 56, when, when I gave you the little outline, that's all about discerning the time of when things will happen, things from the future. And it gives this, this, this illusion of the judgment to come. And then even especially when you get to that parable of the fig tree, it, it's clearly an emblem of the judgment of God. If you are barren, if you are found with absolutely no fruit, that will be a tree hewn down and thrown into the fire. That's, that's, that's a symbol, an emblem of the judgment day when Jesus comes back. And so in our second point, we see that, that the watchfulness is not just a servant. It is a ready servant. And what is he ready about? He is ready to receive his Lord. He is ready for his Lord's coming. Um, the readiness has all to do with 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 an expectation that at any moment, at any given time, and even if it takes 10 years, a 1,000 years, but that servant will be found ready. Since it can be any moment, I want to be found ready for the coming of my Savior, the coming of my Lord. So go back to that little parable in verse 36. Um, look at the readiness here. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. If you're the servant in a home, um, in the parable, the Lord Jesus puts the Lord as a man who went to a wedding. And he will come only later at night. Some weddings would go late into the night. And 
And some weddings would be several days and the servant would be home and he would keep the lamps burning so that if he came late at night, there would be light to enter into his room and to find the house from a distance. And he would have his loins girded. And of course, this, this was a way you would speak of somebody ready in those days where you would wear a robe and the girding would be a belt that you would put over um, your, your, your garment and and gird your robes there so that if you had to walk about the house, it wouldn't be your robes flowing everywhere and maybe making you trip. The belt would be to give a, a sense of, of readiness. Um, it's the same idea that we have when we speak of putting up our sleeves and getting ready to work or taking our coat off and, and just being flexible and able. That's the readiness, but see, what for? Um, Verse 36, it says, And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, so that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. And so the demeanor of watchfulness is that of a servant, of a ready servant, a ready servant for the coming of Jesus. And, and I just want for the remainder of this point of, of a ready servant to just remind us, and, and we need this, don't we, to be reminded of the, of the absolute reality that Jesus is coming. There are many things that we don't know. We don't know um, as we stand if there will be a, a, a pretty soon or if it will be in many years to come a third world war. We don't know if there will be more diseases to come in the, fu- in the, in the near future. We know, of course, from what the Bible says that there will be. But we don't know when that will be. It's uncertain exactly how it will attack us, where it will come from. We don't know many things. We don't know if there will be times of great revival and many years still where the church will flourish before the coming of the Lord Jesus. There there are things in the Bible that seem to point to that reality. But we know one thing with absolute certainty is that the Lord Jesus is coming back. And just as a, as a brief overview, it was prophesied in the Old Testament by the prophets. And, and there's a, a precious part in the New Testament speaking of a prophet in the Old Testament. And we don't find this prophet in the Old Testament saying this, but it was clearly something that circulated in the days of Jude, um, what we believe to be one of Jesus' brothers. In Jude 1, verse 14, we hear him speaking of Enoch. He says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. See, Enoch, from the very days of Adam and Eve, he was a seventh from Adam. He was already proclaiming that the Lord would come in this glorious way. That that wasn't the first coming. To come with ten thousands of his saints, that's the second coming. And then Daniel, perhaps one of the most well-known Old Testament prophecy of the coming of Christ, the second coming, is Daniel 7, 13 where he says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. See, the Son and the Father are communing, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed Jesus, of course, made it very clear that he would come back. In John 14, 2, we read, In my Father's house are many mansions. If, I, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And then in Revelation, the Lord Jesus says in chapter 22, 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And then the 
Apostles also continued proclaiming this truth. Um, in Acts 1, verse 11, um, we read, oh, this was the angels who said, when, when, when Jesus ascended, remember, the angels came to the apostles and said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. You see, his second coming has nothing of humility connected to it in terms of, 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 of earthiness and, and being in a manger and being in a stable. No, it's all full of glory. It is human. He's coming with his human body, but it is in a glorious and amazing way. First Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. It'll be an event, an event that absolutely no one will ever, ever miss. Um, it is astonishing to think how many false prophets have decreed when Jesus would return. And those days have gone and passed. Nothing happened. Everything was quiet. And, and men and women don't, don't learn to stop doing this. You look at, at lists, there, there are more people with more predictions of times in the future. Um, we, we just read that it, it's a time that we won't be aware of. It's not a time that we can predict. Jesus said not even the Son of Man knows a day and hour. How boastful of a human to think that we can predict that day. But it will be a glorious day. When it happens, we will all know. And then one last verse, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. He will appear not now to take care of sin, but to bring unto himself those who have been saved. And so... The theology of watchfulness, it is a heart of servanthood. It is a heart of ready servanthood, a ready servant. But then number three, it is also a heart of diligence. And I have here in my outline a diligent servant, but I really should have in my outline a diligent master. And, and I'll explain why. Um, in verse 38, um, 39 actually, we have here a very micro parable. Jesus was known to do these where in a couple lines it was really like a little parable, a very tiny one. And look at this 39. And this know that if the goodman of the house, so now we're not speaking of a servant, we're speaking of a master. He's the goodman of the house. He's the owner of the house. And the word here for master is simply that of being an owner. There, there are words for master that imply even more authority. This is one that simply means this man owned the house. And if he had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. And then he says, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. See, Jesus is using the, the example of the thief. When I was growing up, the little boy I always got confused thinking, how can Jesus come as a thief because a thief is bad? And, and it's, it's not so hard to understand. Thieves don't come where they announce. I remember I, I mentioned how in that city that I lived in Brazil, they, they did announce that they would come. Um, if they found you home, they wouldn't come. And, and, and that kind of defies what, what, a, what a thief is supposed to do. But um, as a city grows bigger, they stop calling. And they start realizing that they better not popularize what they're going to do. And that's typically what thieves do. They just show up when you're not expecting. And Jesus is using this example to say, you don't know the time and hour that I will come. So be ready at any given time. 
But you notice Jesus is bringing one more dimension to the readiness. It is one of diligence. See, now it's a master who owns a house. And if the thief breaks in unawares, he loses the house. There is a, there is a burglary. There is something that was entrusted to this man that will be lost by this man because he wasn't diligent. He wasn't careful. So Christ is now bringing um, this sense not only of readiness of when Christ will come, but also a diligence in terms of a carefulness, in terms of precaution, in terms of thinking ahead. It is the idea of being diligent so that you secure and you protect what you have given to you from God. So, so this thought, of course, brings to our minds the danger that we are in. It also brings to mind the responsibility that you bear. Um, in the first parable, the responsibility was to serve the master who might come at any moment. But then in this second little parable, the responsibility is that of protection what you have, protecting what you have. And so and this is why this is now not a servant, but a master, someone who owns something. He, he actually is an, an, an owner and he needs to protect, he needs to defend, um, he needs to guarantee the safety of what he has, what was entrusted to him. And so to watch is to serve, to serve with readiness, because Jesus might come any hour. And it is to protect, to protect with diligence. Um, it even brings the sense that in this world there are people wanting to take away what belongs rightfully to God. They want to snatch it away. They want to steal your testimony away. And, and you're to be diligent. Not allow the thief to come and take it away. And so the principles of the one who watches. Number one, he's a servant. Number two, he's a ready servant. Number three, he is a diligent owner. A diligent servant. Um, and number four. When we come to our fourth point. It's not so much... Um, who a person who watches is, it is simply in the sense of how blessed a person who watches is. This is, this is the re reward part. This is where Jesus is bringing in a reality to encourage you, to woo you into being a watchful servant and being diligent and being ready. It is the great blessing of the servant. He, he says it in verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Now, this is astonishing. Um, it's amazing to see what Jesus is doing because he's putting the one who watches as a servant. In one little um, parable, he makes a twist where this servant is now the goodman of the house. He's an owner of a house. Now, I really believe that what Jesus does here is bring now a third twist when he introduces the blessedness. And this servant who becomes an owner, he is actually a master who has servants at his feet. And that is another realm of being a master. A master is not just someone who owns his house, but a master who is who, who is responsible for, for other people and for other servants who are at his service, who actually um, put their lives, as it were, somewhat in secondary because in their primary way they're going to serve their master. That's, that's the word for master applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me show you where this twist happens Look at verse 37 again. Why are the servants who are found ready blessed? Whom the Lord, when he cometh, keep that little he in your mind, when he, the Lord of that house cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he, the master, the Lord, shall gird himself and make them, the watchful servants, to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Did you notice that when we first read this passage? It almost seems like there's a play in our heads of what Jesus is doing, but it's all very clear. Jesus is saying, this is how I treat my servants who are faithful and who are watching. I will make them to sit, and I will be a servant to them. 
and I will feed them and make them be served by me. Now, this is exactly what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily, I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. These are not just people who own a house. They own servants. And who are these servants? Their very master. And you see what Jesus is saying, put this into the context of the only master this world has ever known who actually is a servant as well, the Lord Jesus Christ. And beloved, we had a little display of that this morning because when we partake of the table, it is not humans who are serving us. Even that bread and that wine that we partake of, although those are earthly elements, Christ does tell us to raise our hearts from what they are in earthly ways and acknowledge they, they, they are emblems of Christ. And Jesus is our servant at the table, serving us, feeding us, giving you food and giving you wine, that your heart will rejoice, that you would be nurtured. And Jesus is feeding you with himself. You the master, he the servant. And it's not surprising. This is who our Savior is. He is God Almighty. He is the ruler of all things. He's the creator. Nothing that exists exists without Christ. And yet to serve us, he came to this world as a baby. Wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. None of us in our right minds choose an animal trough as a crib. But the creator of heaven and earth did. Because he came as a servant. And as he lived his life, he was a servant from morning to evening. As a servant, he would stay up all night often praying for you and for me, for the people that he was ministering to. As a servant, he would touch the leprous man and says, I will be thou clean. As a servant, he would see this man miserable with the legion of demons that he had that possessed him. And he servant-like raised that man from that dust. And as a servant, he gave himself and fed 5,000 plus people. And then as a servant, he takes them to the Last Supper in the upper room. And literally as a servant, he girds himself. He takes the, 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 he takes his robe off, the garments aside. He takes a towel and girds himself. Think of that. He girds himself. The Lord Jesus takes the place of a slave and kneels before every disciple, even Judas who betrayed him, and begins to wash their feet. He takes their dusty and dirty feet upon his lap. He infuses those feet with water. He scrubs them, cleanses them, and he rinses them. And then he proceeds to dry them with that towel. And that was not all. That was just a prelude of his majestic servant's heart. Because in the evening of that hour, he would, as a slave, sell himself into the hands of his enemies. He would surrender into the grips of the corrupt and worldly leadership of the high priest. He would submit to their wicked and botched justice system. And then he would endure their lies, their mockery, and their lies, and their beatings. And then he would submit to the corrupt Roman justice system and endure their blasphemies and their scorn and their scourges and then he would endure the cross and its terrors he would endure the darkness of the father's wrath and then death and the grave no one who's ever stepped upon this ground 
knows more of what it means to be a servant than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he girded up his loins and he served you and me for all who partook of bread and wine. He was serving you like a king because you were being fed the most precious dainties this world has ever known. There is no bigger and better and more blessed banquet. Beloved, if you've never partaken of the Lord's Supper, your heart should be beating with the yearnings to do so. Because at the Supper, the Lord Jesus is inviting you to serve you as if you were the king and he is the servant. And what does he do at the Supper? He teaches us. We don't rise thinking I'm a king. We rise thinking, oh, what a servant I ought to be because that is who my master is. And it all of a sudden becomes easy to wash other people's feet. And it becomes easy to see people who are beside the ground and needing someone to love. And and before our hearts would think, oh, it's just too hard to go. They're too humiliating. All of a sudden, it isn't. All of a sudden, it's, it's something you want to do because you want to serve other needy people because you're mindful how needy you are. And God came from heaven to serve you. See, this is the blessedness of the servant. He turns you, as it were, into a master, and he, the master, serves you. And it would be amazing and majestic to think that the master would send angels to do that or send other servants to do that. But no, you see how the text says, this is Jesus saying, he says, I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and he will come forth and serve them. And while Jesus says this, he is their servant on the way to Calvary. This is getting close and near to the end. Jesus certainly has in his mind, pretty soon I'll be serving you like no man has ever served others before. That's the blessedness. And so to be a watchful person is to be a servant. But do you see that you only gain when you submit yourself to Jesus? He doesn't treat you in a humiliating, in a despising, and in a gross way. And you might say, yeah, pastor, but I've heard the story of these pastors or or missionaries who end up burnt alive or who end up being persecuted and forgotten in the prisons. Where, Where is the blessing for them? The blessing, beloved, at that hour is that those souls are thinking, I'm having the privilege to know something of what my servant Savior suffered for me. He too was persecuted. And now I'm being persecuted. I'm being given to feel in my flesh a little something of what Jesus felt to save me. And if I die and when I die will be the moment I even see my Savior who served me this way. And I will go from the Lord's Supper banquets to the eternal banquet in the presence of my Lord. This is why to the heart of a watchful servant, dying is not done. It is not the ultimate evil. The ultimate evil is a second death. And the second death will be experienced by all who do not watch. And this is even where the Lord Jesus will go. And I'll just read verse 46. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he's not aware, this is the non-watchful servant, and will cut him in sunder and will appoint him, his portion, with the unbelievers. And, And Jesus will bring several times this reality. If you're not a servant who watches, you're in grave danger. If you are a servant who watches, there may be danger now. Jesus will come and talk about that. There will be maybe danger in your own home. Persecution from mother, father, son, or daughter. But Jesus is saying, just don't worry. There will be that blessed and glorious day. And he starts by showing this blessedness. The blessed servant. Blessed because you are served by your Savior. And this is exactly what Jesus did with his life and how he ended. And I pray that there may be not a single soul among us here 
who would shrink from the duty of being a watchful servant, a ready servant, and a diligent servant. And rejoice in the reality that you will be a blessed servant if you trust him as your Savior. You will find him as a faithful Lord, even treating you as a master. But that will never rise up to your head. You will know it is how he lead, serves me. It is how he cares for me. He's really the master. And I will bow before him. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God, Lord, even as we are in this portion where the Lord Jesus is teaching us the theology of watchfulness, of watching, we pray, Lord, teach us to have a watching heart. Make us to be thy servants, ready servants and diligent servants, and that we may rejoice in being blessed servants, blessed by thy serving grace and love. And Lord, we pray that thou would graciously bring into thy kingdom of light those who henceforth have not had faith. But Lord, would thou this very moment create faith in the heart that they may be saying even in their own silent prayers, Lord, I desire to be thy servant. Forgive me and cleanse me of all my sins, of all my, my rebellion and not wanting to serve Thee. Lord, place these words in this very heart that they would cease being the owners of their souls when it's a lie because none of us are. None of us can keep our, our years from aging. We cannot keep our bodies from ailing. We cannot keep ourselves, Lord, from the grave. So, Lord, give these hearts a, a truth about them that they would confess, Oh, be my Lord, be my Savior, and help me to watch. Help me to be ready. And that these souls, Lord, may start experiencing something of this blessedness as we again thank Thee, Lord, as we were invited by Thee to join Thee at the table, being fed bread and wine that are emblems of the very body and blood of Christ. There's no greater banquet upon this earth. And we thank Thee, Lord, for serving us and for serving us with Thy very body and blood, dying on the cross for sinners. And, O oh Lord, we pray graciously, have a glorious harvest of souls that we would all be watchful servants. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.